Hello and welcome to Algorithms Live. Uh, this week what we're doing is talking about the NAIA PC 2019 contest that took place over the weekend. So that's the North America Invitational Programming Contest. And my guest this week is a fellow judge, which is Luan Gien, which we uh, all of you should be familiar with because he's been the most frequent guest on the show. So Luan, thanks for coming back on. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Yep, and uh, we we're we were one of a handful of judges, well, quite a few judges that were helping out with the contest. So we just want to give credit to all the people that helped uh, with made the contest possible by adding data or or otherwise. Um, if you're interested in future years for like submitting a problem um, or uh, or being a judge, um, you can message me over Code Forces and I can introduce you to the Chief Judge Van B. But uh, you should be. Uh, not a competitor and be, be done with the contest. And uh, we're always looking for more judges and problem submissions. Uh, yeah, we definitely need a lot of help on the contest. And um, yeah, everybody does contribute a lot to it. And of course, one of the reasons why we're uh, doing the problem review, so we're going to go through all the problems from the contest at kind of like a high level. Uh, but Rob ZH uh, was asking for this from previous years in AIPCs. We haven't really released editorials. Uh, so we thought it'd be kind of cool to just make an Algorithms Live episode where we discuss all the problems. So what we're going to do is just go in uh, problem order uh, by difficulty instead of by alphabetical or what we estimate the difficulty of the contest to be. So our first problem is subsequences in substring. Uh, so Lewin, do you want to start explaining? Um, yeah, so in this problem, you're given a string S um, consisting of lowercase letters and also another string T um, also consisting of lowercase letters. And you want to count the number of substrings in S that contain the uh, string T as a subsequence. Um, so uh, the substrings of S don't need to be unique. So like if basically the substring is defined as like two indices are like an interval of the original string. Um, and then uh, as we, um, and we just want to count the number of substrings which have T as a subsequence. So in this problem, the bounds are number of characters in S is up to 100,000 and the number of characters in T is up to 100. So, uh, maybe we can give an example of an interval where this works. Yeah, so the current interval that is underlined, or I guess you just uh, erased uh, it. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll go from here, yeah. OK, um, so the interval underline does contain, does contain t as a subsequence. So we can see there's like um, the first two p's are apple, the first apple, the a is from the second. And then there's two ways to complete it, but it doesn't matter. We just need it to contain it at least once. Um, so that's a valid interval. Mm -hmm. um, an invalid interval, uh, you might want to show um, could just be like if you took like only three characters or something, right? Yeah, or, or something like this maybe, right? So there's maybe there's a way for us to get the two P's, but then we can't. Yeah, they're not in order. Yeah. Yeah. So like we do want the, let, the letters to be there in the correct order also. Yeah, so um, th this would also be invalid, right? Yeah, that would be invalid because the A, like we need two P's up here, then an A, then another P. Mm-hmm. OK, so um, yeah, so we can talk about some approaches. So the bounds on S are pretty high, but the bounds on P are really low. Um, so one thing that might come to mind immediately is just like try all substrings of S and then see what works. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you check? Let's just try to solve the easier problem of checking if a substring contains a subsequence or like um, another string as a subsequence. So like, how do we check if S contains T? Um, so one way we can do that is instead of like iterating through each character of S, we can try to find like we can greedily find the next position in T that needs um, or that uh, we need to get. So for example, if we're looking at this substring, we start at the beginning and then we try to get the earliest P that appears. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there we try to go to the second character, find the next P. From there go to the next character, find the next A and the next one, that's P, right? So we can do this in one pass. Um, so right now, this requires us to iterate through all the characters in S, kind of like we just look through 
mm -hmm. um, both strings, and um, we keep like some counter. Uh, but one way we can speed this up is by computing like some next pointers. So like um, for each position, we can pre-compute what's the next occurrence of the letter A, like strictly after I, right? So like next I returns uh, the first occurrence of A strictly after I. Um, and uh, we can pre-compute this in O of S times like number of letters time. So basically the way we can do that is like iterate from the back to the front and like next I comma A or like next I A is like computed from like next I plus one A like using some dynamic programming, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that there's no A after this position. We can just define next I like A to be like infinity if it doesn't exist or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, right now, this lets us not have to iterate through all the characters. Instead, we can just iterate through the characters in T, and we just compute these next pointers, and then like check that it doesn't exceed the right bound um, of like the current interval that we're checking. Ah, so, so the idea is brute force the starting position, so start of the interval, and then just... Uh, like once you have a fixed starting, let's call it A, uh, then what we, we do is we just have an inner loop where we're go going over T, and then mm -hmm. we just greedily follow this process. Yeah. And we can use the pre-computed next table for all starting positions. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, so this approach, like you iterate through all substrings, then you can check if a substring is valid in O of T time just by following the next pointers. Awesome. And that'll tell you like the furthest right you have to go. Um, or it's like the, the left the, most right point that you have to go for yeah. it to be valid. Yeah. And then you can always, uh, you can always work any substring that's bigger than that. So maybe this is the left most right point. So any of these ending positions over here are possible for the B of the string. Yeah. So then this ends up becoming your count for that starting position. Yeah, that's right. So like instead of having to iterate through all substrings, you can just iterate through the start point. You know the earliest or the shortest string starting at that position that satisfies the condition. And then any string that you extend still satisfies the condition. So you can just add all of them in um, constant time. All right. So the next problem is intersecting rectangles. So Lewin, you want to take it away? Yeah, so in this problem, we're given some rectangles in a 2D plane, and the rectangles are all axis aligned. So um, like they can be specified by two points, and then that's like the lower left coordinate and the upper right coordinate. And in this problem, we define intersection a little bit differently. So we'll say they intersect if their borders strictly intersect, or like their boundaries have any common points. So two rectangles that are nesting within each other don't count as intersecting. Um, so it's slightly different from the normal definition. Um, and in this problem, we want to count, uh, or we want to determine if there are any pair of rectangles that are intersecting. Um, so one condition that we also forced in the input was that all x coordinates are distinct and all y coordinates are distinct, just to make it a little bit cleaner so you don't have to deal with edge cases where like um, the rectangles like overlap on an edge or something. Like you only have to deal with the case where like something they, like this, like, right? Yeah. Um, so what that means is you only need to handle the case where like a vertical segment or, uh, intersects a horizontal one. And you don't have to deal with the case where like corners touch or stuff like that too. Um, OK, so this is a pretty classic problem. Um, oh, and the bounds on the rectangles, there's up to 100,000 rectangles. And like the coordinates are pretty large also. but. Um, I think the coordinates were up to 10 to the 5, or it might have been 10 to the 9. That yes, doesn't matter yeah, too much. Negative 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 9. But the first thing you can do is just like compress the input so that they lie in the range of 0 to n instead. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, we can rephrase this to like given some line segments, determine if any pair of them intersect or not, right? Because um, two vertical, or actually like it's a little bit, simpler than that. Like all the line segments are horizontal or vertical. And you can only get intersections within horizontal slash vertical. Like you're never gonna get vertical, vertical intersections or like 
horizontal horizontal intersections. Um, so uh, the easiest way, or there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, one way is you can use like a segment tree. So um, let's just consider the lines in order, or like um, we do like a line sweep. So um, so let's go from x uh, increasing values of x. So I guess yeah. your segment tree is on y coordinates. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is our segment tree. Um, yeah. So basically, in this segment tree, we'll keep track of which. Uh, so as we're doing the sweep, we keep track of in this uh, segment tree which um, horizontal lines cross our sweep line at this current moment. So um, it's just like one or zero, and uh, we just want to, yeah. So in this case, there are two rectangles or two lines crossing there. And then whenever we get a vertical line, what we want to say is like, is there anything that's filled in within this range? Um, so you do have to be a little bit careful, like since these are rectangles, some of them are touching at edges, but you don't want to, or some of them are, some of the uh, like segments are touching at corners. So you want to process like the opening part of the rectangle before adding the vertical lines, and then remove those vertical lines when you like process the closing part of the rectangle. Um, so like when you sort the vertical lines, you need to keep track of whether they're like opening or closing parts of rectangles. Okay, and then the <clears throat> the query of like if anything intersects is we just we just do normal segment tree query and just like yeah. Okay. We can check like if the sum is bigger or something like that. Um, you can keep like a count of the number of things like in this, in this range. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you can use like a Fenwick tree also. That's a lot easier to implement too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so just basically... replace this with that Fenwick tree. Cool. All right. So we'll move on to the next problem. All right. So the next problem we're going to cover is problem A, a piece of cake. Okay, yeah, so in this problem, you're given a polygon with an, a convex polygon with n vertices, and you're given a fixed number k. And what you do is you choose k random vertices um, of this polygon, and k is between 3 and n. And then you um, take like the convex hole of those points, and you want to know what's the expected area of this polygon. Um, so, yeah, this problem is. Uh, a little bit, uh, or so the way you can solve this is through like linearity of expectation. So, um, how can we decompose the area of a polygon that's cut out? So, if you consider just like one line, like one edge of the polygon, or like one edge of the inner polygon that we choose, we can see it cuts off some portion of the larger polygon. Um, yeah, so, this portion is cut off now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what we can do is we can compute the area of this portion that's cut off, and we can compute also the area or the probability that this edge is included. Um, so the probability that the edge is included is basically we choose the two points that define the edge, and we don't choose any of the points that lie um, clockwise to it or uh, counterclockwise to it. I mean, so if let's say there were a few more points here, we want it's the the probability that this is true and this is true. So let's yeah. call that uh, pi times pj. And then mm -hmm. um, it's also the probability that we don't pick pi plus 1 through J. pj minus 1. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the thing is these probabilities aren't independent because we choose k vertices, right? Uh, but instead, what we can do is count the number of configurations that include this edge instead. So the count is just like some binomial coefficient. So there's n choose k ways of choosing vertices. So that's like the denominator of this probability. And the numerator is um, like basically you look at the number of points in between and you subtract that out and you choose, you do like n minus 2 choose or a uh, you do n minus the number of points in between minus 2, choose k minus 2. Yeah, uh, so that makes n sense. minus so, j plus 1, or I guess is minus 1? Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, and then okay. choose k 
minus two, right? Because um, k minus two because we fix two of the the things that are in our partition already, and k minus two is like freely chosen within the things that are clockwise to us. Um, so uh, basically, if we compute that for every edge, or we compute the area that it cuts off, and then um, this probability multiply them, and then subtract that from the overall probability or the overall area of the polygon. Is there uh, another technique that maybe uses like the cross product trick? Yeah. So another thing is like computing the area of the outside polygon is a little bit tedious, I guess. Like uh, one way instead to represent the area of a polygon is to use like uh, the shoelace formula, which uh, like basically you only need to know the coordinates of the each uh, of the points that lie on each edge, right? So it is like a cross product. Yeah, so cross product will give you this area multiplied by two. So this is where zero, zero is. And it'll also mm -hmm. be signed. So if it was going in the other direction, it would actually be a negative. And so you can also use this to deal with areas, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah, so basically this is a lot easier to compute than um, having to compute the outside area. Uh, one other thing to note is like some of the precision. So like computing the binomial coefficients might not be feasible because n is up to like 2,000, I think, or something like that. Um, so one way you can compute the probability is by using logs. Um, another way is you can kind of compute this probability um, by like multiplying some fractions together, I guess, or like, and if it gets too small, you can just say it's zero and like ignore it from then on. Can you also do like the probabilistic Pascal's triangle? Um, you could do that. I'm not. I think that way it does work too. So if you just do it in doubles, um, I think it should be fine. Uh, I'm not too sure if there were issues with that or not. I can't remember exactly. Okay. So the next problem we're going to talk about is this XOR sequences problem. Okay. Yeah. So this is a little bit hard to explain. So first, like we explain the problem then we try to solve like the reverse of the problem. So um, in this problem, in the first problem, we're given a sequence x1 through xn. And then um, for each number between 0, uh, and we're also given a number m, uh, which is different, or like, which is a separate number. Um, oh, so this is up to m? Or this is n, x1 through xn. And then there's also a number m that's provided as input. OK, so is it like? But these are different n's. Or n. Oh, sorry, it's like hard to. Oh, m. For each number between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1, like let's just call this number i or something for each number between, uh, for each number i in this range, uh, we compute a number p of i. So p of i is equal to the index x uh, of like index from 1 through n that maximizes the xor of like i and one of the x, um, x size, or xj, sorry. Um, so p, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so p of i is the index of x that maximizes x4 with i. Here's the formal equation from the problem statement. Uh, yeah, and in this case, i is not equal to p of y. Um, and also, all the x's are distinct. So this condition is guaranteed to be satisfied for some p, uh, for some number. Yeah. So, so like intuitively, if you have some sequence, uh, I don't know, like one, one, then if we selected this location in this particular, particular piece, it, P of I would just be, or P of Y would just be the index. So let's say this is Y. Uh, P of Y would just be the index that maximizes this XOR value. So in this case, would it be five? Um, so right. look at it in binary. Yeah, look at it in binary. Yeah. So in this case, like XOR 2 and 5 is 7, which is 1, 1, 1. And yeah. that's going to be bigger than anything else that's in the sequence. That, like, if you XOR it with something else, that's this piece of the equation. So if I took something like 1, uh, if I XOR it with uh, Y, then I would get 3. So 1, 1 in binary. And you can see that's smaller than 7. And so there's no uh, better choice. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so the thing is, like, all the numbers in X are distinct. So there can't be duplicates in there. And uh, we know Y, like, we know the Y values for every number in that range. 
uh, for every number between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. Um, so all the x's are also constrained between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, so the problem is, um, so this is not the actual problem. So the actual problem is you're given the array p of i, or p of y, and you want to count the number of x's that could have generated it through this um, algorithm. So this is what's given for all values y, and, yeah. and you just want to know, like, what, what's the input array? Like what, uh, what we want to all... know the number of solutions that could generate it. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what are all possible input arrays that could exist? Yeah. Or like the, the, num the count of them. Yeah, modulo, the count of them. Yeah, 10 to the 9 plus 7. Yeah, so you take a module or something because it can get pretty big. Uh, okay, yeah. So basically, um, there are two different cases to consider when looking at the topmost bit. Either the x, is, the, the x size have, like, are all set to the same, or there exists like some that are zero, some that are one, if you look at the top of this bit. So in the first case, if they're the same, what I claim is that the resulting array has to have, or like you can split the array into two halves, like the PE array into two halves, both of which have to be exactly the same. Because um, what happens is like all the XIs act exactly the same on the top of this bit. So the lower bits uniquely determine the results. So Basically, like all of them have to be the same. Um, in the second case, what we can see is there exists one position that has zero and one position that has one. Um, what I claim here is that the two arrays contain disjoint uh, numbers. Like there can't be any number that appears in both the first half and the second half. Um, if that's the case, then that means that. Um, so basically, the way to see that is like each number either flips the topmost bit or doesn't. And um, like you can see that it can't be the case that like some index um, maximizes something when it flips something versus maximizes something when it doesn't flip. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. So like one way to think about it is like um, if there is a number x i with uh, topmost bit zero and a number x i with topmost bit one, then if you look at all the numbers from zero to y, like you can split it into two cases. Like either the topmost bit is one or zero. So if the topmost bit is zero, it can only be maximized by something that, by some x i which has topmost bit equal to one. Otherwise, it can only be maximized by something that's topmost bit zero. Oh, okay. So you're looking at like, are you going through like p of i in reverse order or something, or are you? Uh, no. I, what I'm claiming is like some structure on p of i. So like, I'm claiming either the two halves are exactly the same or they're disjoint. So what, what would be the two halves of P of I in each of these examples? Like, I guess I'm confused on what the halves are. So the half is just like um, arrays of length two. So like in the first case, it's like one zero is the first half, then one zero is the second half. The second case, one one is the first half, zero zero is the second half. So like you split the array in half, um, and then there's a first half and second half. Like okay. you and so this, this corresponds to the bits where there's um, one and then a bunch of x's because these are unknown. And then yeah. this corresponds to the case where it's a zero and then there's a yeah. bunch of x's because these are unknown. Yeah, that's right. OK. Yeah. And so um, you're claiming that either the, the first half and the second half are identical to each other. Yeah or they all have to be exactly the opposite of each other? Like or you... they don't have to be exactly the opposite, they just have to be disjoint. So like, they don't share any common numbers. Like in this case, you can see like- <coughs> Oh, I see. So like, <coughs> like if there was a one over here or a zero over here, then you'd have a problem. Yeah, so like uh, no number appears in both sides. Okay, uh, Yeah. that's what you mean by disjoint. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, so like it's not too hard to prove that this must be the case in some valid solution. Um, so the way you look at that is by looking at the topmost bit and splitting into different cases, right? Either all the xi's have the same topmost bit, or there's two different topmost bits in xi. Okay, so then they end up just like it allows you to like cancel each other out, and then you have to have some other bit determine what the maximum would be. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
Um, okay, so how do you do the counting? So in the, in the disjoint case, it's, uh, you just take the product recursively. If you recursively compute the counts on the first and second halves. Mm -hmm. um, in the first case, um, I mean, there are two cases. Either the topmost bits are all zeros or they're all ones. So you just multiply by two and then just recurse on like only one half of the array. Um, and if neither of these conditions are satisfied, you just return zero immediately because there's no way to complete it. OK. So it's kind of like, in a way, like a dynamic programming, you'd say, or? Um, kind of, I guess. Except uh, uh, I guess it turns into either the exact same subproblem done twice or, or you do the disjoint problems completely separate. So there's no overlap. So I guess it's not dynamic programming. Yeah, but you're just basically doing some recursion yeah. like, um, and splitting it in half each time. OK, cool. So you're, like your recursive function might look like something like i and j is like the area of the array that you're currently considering. Yeah. And then you just like solve the problem and then you can determine like overlap or no overlap. OK, that's cool. And then it, it's kind of like divide and conquer in a way. So the runtime would be like n log n, where n is uh, the length of p of i, or? Yeah, yeah, it's like n log n. Um, I think you can speed it up to like O of n, but it's like not to, or like it's like O to the 2 to the n, because it's like you have to iterate through. Um, like that? To the n, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because the way the input's defined. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so the next problem is problem D. It's a mod, 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 mod world. I may have yeah. said the wrong number of mods. But... Uh, I think that's the right number. Uh, OK. But uh, yeah, so this problem, uh, you're, uh, it's just to compute a sum. It's like the summation from so 1 through given, n. You're given oh, yeah, through... you're given p, q, and n. Mm -hmm. And you want to compute the summation from 1 through n of p times i mod real q. Um, and like this overall sum doesn't have any mod, so like um, like the number could be like the resulting answer could be bigger than q. Uh, so the first step of this problem is uh, you can reduce it to like a summation of floor functions. So like let's just compute the sum of p of i, p times i from one through n, and to subtract all multiples of q. So like you subtract uh, p times i floor q times q. Are you, so you can how, how are you rewriting the equation, or uh, so you can rewrite p times i modulo q as p times i minus p times i floor or like p times i divided by q uh, floored times q. Right. Uh, uh, so it should be p times i minus this thing that you just wrote. Ah, uh, okay. Let me. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the summation on the first term is pretty easy. It's just like p times n times n minus 1 divided by 2, or uh, n plus 1 divided by 2, right? Um, the second one, q is constant, so you can pull it out. So you just want to find the summation uh, of this the, of the floor function. Uh, so let's, let's rework the equation so that people can understand what you're saying. So you're basically saying, like, this is really easy to calculate because I can just, like, pull this p out. Like I'm breaking up the summation in half. Like this is one summation now, and this is another summation. Yeah. And so you're you're grouping all this together, and then you're subtracting out this piece. You're pulling out the q because it's a constant. But the tough part of the problem right now is just this summation from i equals one to n of this floor function. Okay. So the first one is easy to compute, like some from one through n of i's, like. Uh, you can compute that in constant time. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, like the main part of the problem. Uh, so one uh, thing we can say just to make it easier is like the GCD of P and Q is one because like you can always like remove a factor um, or divide by their GCDs. Um, you have to do this after you multiply by p and q in the before step. So like this is only when we're considering the sum problem. Um, so and another uh, assumption we can make is that p is less than q. So let's say p is bigger than q. Uh, what we can do is pull out like um, whole numbers from 
like uh, if P is bigger than Q, we can like pull out P for Q, um, and like replace P with P mod Q. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're you, you basically in the case where this is bigger, then you just yeah you 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 mod P by Q, and just replace it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So we make the assumption that P is less than Q. Uh, we can pull out like uh, P over Q. Uh, and like that's easy to compute. Um, okay, so p is less than q. Uh, if that's the case, um, we can look at this fraction uh, p times i divided by q, and we know that this GCD is uh, one. Uh, I think one other thing you could also do is like let's say n is less than q, um, because I think if um, n is bigger than q, then like you can also take out things. But I, I don't know if that helps too much. Um, I don't think you need that to solve this problem necessarily, but or n should be less than q. I mean, if n is bigger than q, then like um, I think you can pull out some other things um, from there also. Okay, so uh, once you have these assumptions, let's try to rewrite this problem. So the floor of p times i divided by q. Let's instead um, compute the number of these fractions such that this number is like less, less than or equal or is at least equal to some number n, let's say. What? Uh, so instead of computing this directly, let's compute um, like the number of i's such that p times i over q floor is at least n for some number n. So like let f of n equal the number of I such that this condition is satisfied. So f of m it is a number of i's where this is true. Yeah, and i is between like one through n, right? Um, so how do we compute this? Um, okay, so like uh, the floor function is like a uh, increasing function, right? So like we can kind of like um, yeah, we can look for n somehow. Um, but basically what I claim is that the final answer is a summation of n from like 1 through um, some some big number. Summation so, uh, of... Before, yeah, so before we go into how to compute f of n, let's just rewrite our answer in terms of f of n. So what I claim is that the summation of the floors is equivalent to the summation of f of n from n equals 1 to some big number, um, which we'll define at some point. Is, so it's equal to the summation of? From m equals 1 to uh, something. Like, let's just call it, like, x or something. Yeah. OK, so um, and we'll say, like, x is big enough so that, like, f of x is equal to 0 or something, right? Because, like, once we get high enough, like, none of the higher terms contribute to our sum. Uh, so the way we can see why this is true is kind of similar to, um, I mean, basically we're just counting like uh, everything that contributes at least one contributes to f of one. Everything that contributes at least two contributes to f of two, right? And then like it's just summing, summing it in a different way. Okay, so um, okay, so how do we compute f of m? Uh, so f of m. Let's rewrite our equation. So um, we know i is less than q, right? Because i is less than m. And the equation you have, like the p times i over q, is bigger than or equal to m. So you end up getting like something like this divided by q squared. Uh, or you multiply both sides by q. Oh, oh, I see. So the equation up here, you multiply both sides by q. Yeah. Like the left-hand side and the right-hand side? Yeah. Uh, how does that help when you have the floor function in the way? Um, so I think the inequality is still true if you do that, right? Uh, well, it's an equality, right? Not an inequality? Or, or are you... Or I, I'm talking about, sorry, the inequality on the top. Oh, this one? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. So multiply this by Q up here and multiply this by Q here. So QM. Yeah. Okay. Or like you multiply by Q and divide by P. And I think you get like I is at least the ceiling of Q times M over P. And so yeah. how do you manipulate this? So I think, uh, I don't remember the exact steps, but I think you can show that I is at least um, like the ceiling of this or something like that. Or like, yeah, I forget what exactly you do to like con convert the floor function to ceiling function, but like, um, like you have an upper and lower bound for I, right? Like you want. Oh yeah, for like, because it's like a step function, right? And for a given a given m value, we want to just compute the number of i's. So here's like our given m value. We want to know the number of i's that contribute to it. Yeah, and so yeah, so it contributes like <clears throat> all the way to that. So i is at least like the ceiling of q times m over p. Yeah. So you're you're trying to just find for a given value of m, we we want to know like what's this upper bound minus this lower bound. And that's why we're trying to bound it on both sides. Um, or that's one way of looking. Like, we don't need to bound it on both sides. I think you only need to bound it on the lower side. Oh, like, you just want to say, what does i need to be, at least, to exceed n? Oh, because we're we're counting. So basically, instead oh, of counting see, it like vertically, we're counting it or horizontally. OK. OK, that makes sense. Um, yeah, but I think like the point is that i is at least the ceiling of q times m over p. All right. Yeah, so if you rearrange things, you get that condition. Mm -hmm. um, so what f of m is equal to is equal to n minus this quantity here. Uh, maybe plus one somewhere, or right. maybe not, I don't remember. Or n, it should be n minus. Oh, yeah. Um, OK, so um, yeah, so now we know what f of m is. And actually, we can notice our summation looks almost the same, but we have a ceiling instead of a floor. Um, so we can convert the ceiling to a floor. It's not too hard. Um, like, either m is divisible by p or not. And like, if it is divisible by p, like, you get ceiling is equal to floor. Otherwise, you get ceiling is equal to like one plus floor, right? Um, okay. So what is x? So like, what do we need to sum this up to? We need to sum this up to um, like n over like what's the when does f of m become zero? So x is equal to like the ceiling of uh, or the floor of like p over q times n, I think. Or uh, q, sorry, uh, p over q times n. P. There, there's no m here because. Oh, p m over is q like, times yeah. m like this, yeah. or yeah, okay, yeah, I think so. Um, so like you can notice that like f of x is equal to like zero, or like f of x plus one is equal to zero, something like that. Okay. So like we don't like x is like the upper bound for a summation. Okay. Um. So actually, like more accurately, f of m should be like the max of zero, comma this quantity, right? Because like, like this number does like it's kind of like it can go negative, but like. It only makes sense if it's zero. So like, um, yeah, like once we hit zero, we don't want to continue past the sum. Um, OK, so um, we can convert f of m into a floor function instead of the ceiling function. Um, so like it depends on whether or not m is divisible by p or not, right? Uh, yeah, so like if we look at the summation, we're summing we want to sum from m equals 1 through x of f of m. And like this is also another function on floor functions, right? So like this is, like if we, convert, if we convert the ceilings to floors, this is another summation on floors. Um, but how does this help us? Like it doesn't seem to change anything. The main thing we did was that we swapped the place of p and q, right? Um, but like if, in this case, we know that p is less than q, right? So this time, Q is bigger than P, but we know how to reduce it to a case where Q is less than P by just like taking out multiples of P from Q. Like you can replace Q with Q mod P. Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah, so you can just keep repeating this until like it's really easy to solve, like when one of them is zero. Uh, uh, like, 
So it's like kind of like Euclid's yeah, algorithm, yeah. like GCD algorithm. Yeah. This, this kind of reminds me of the episode I did with, um, with Endigorian. He had a similar problem where it kind of just took the idea of U Euclid's algorithm uh, and you just kind of reduce things until you have the solvable case. Except this seems a little bit easier. Yeah, I think this one's a little bit easier to analyze. Um, yeah. yeah. Or, or you don't have to like work backwards is the nice part. You can just like... Oh yeah, keep reducing, I guess, and then you're, yeah, it, you're done at the end. Yeah. Okay, so the next problem is busy board. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in this problem, you're given a 2D grid, um, and each grid cell contains like a peg that can be up or down. Um, so it's like X's and O's, X represents down and O represents up. Um, so uh, you're given two configurations and you want to get from the start to end. So a valid move is you choose a peg that's up, you hit it, um, and then that changes that particular peg to down, and all other pegs in the same row and column go up to up. Um, so like, let's just say like we hit the peg in the first row and third column. And so now it goes to down, but everything then, that was down, this one, these all changed yeah. the opposite. So let me mark them in separate colors so these guys go up. Yeah. Um, and things that are up stay up. So you're not toggling. You're only changing everything to up and the thing you hit to down. Um, you're not allowed to hit something that's already down or like it doesn't have any effect if you do that. So you can only hit things that are already up and like hit them down and it changes state. Um, so yeah, that's the only operation you can do. And like you're given a start and end configuration. You want to know if you can get from the start to end. Um, the bounds are pretty big so that you can't do a uh, search. Like you have to find a small, smarter solution. So like the bounds are up to like a thousand each. Um, so this problem is just some casework, I guess, like it is, you just have to like analyze some cases and like make it easier to solve. Um, so one observation is like, if you just like hit a lot of pegs, like you're not, um, you can't ever like hit things so that there's two things in the same row and column at the same time, unless they were like that originally. Um, so like if two things like needed to be down in the same row and column, um, like you can't force both of them to be down at the same time because like if you hit one of them down, it'll hit the other one up. Yeah. So if I um, like hit this one down, or I guess this is already down, but if I like, but you can't hit anything in like the second row if you want both of those to stay down, right? Yeah. So this would flip those and flip these. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. So if I make any move, like, um, like that X has to be by itself in its own row or column. Um. Okay, so uh, this actually constrains our input a lot. So like, let's look at the final configuration and let's look at all columns and rows that have at least two down pegs. If any row, um, so if a row satisfies that condition, if a row has at least two down pegs, we can never perform a move on that row. Um, and similarly for col columns. So we have some set of forbidden rows and forbidden columns. Ah, okay. So yeah. let's say that this is the, and this is us looking at the final configuration, not the yeah, one row. Yeah, from the final configuration. So in this case, the forbidden rows and forbidden columns will be this, this column and this row. Yes. So we can never fix anything, or like we can never hit a peg in that row or column, so we can kind of ignore them. Um, so now there's some cases. We can look at this board, and then we can look at differences between the start and end configuration. Um, so one thing is, um, we can still fix things in forbidden rows and columns indirectly by like popping them up. Um, so like one thing is if there's any X in a forbidden row and column in the final configuration that was not in the start, then like obviously it's impossible to solve because we can't hit it directly down. Like the only way to fix it is to hit it directly. So, um, and the other thing is if something lies in a forbidden row and column, we can't fix it directly or indirectly, because we can never like, um, yeah, so we can never fix that. Um, the other thing is if there's an X in a forbidden row or a column, we can never fix it because we can't hit it. Or like, if it wasn't like that originally, like if the start and end were different and the X is in the final. So 
yeah, let's move this guy over to the right and let's draw maybe an example of a broken board. So what would you want to change in the starting configuration? So like, let's say the top left is an O, right? Uh, so we, if we look at the final configuration, we can't fix the X in the top left call row or top, top left because it lies in a forbidden column. So we can never hit something down in that column. So like that X will never become, like one can never be fixed. So if that condition is true, like we also get impossible. Um, okay, so now, um, yeah, so we handle the case where something lies in a forbidden row and column and something in an X that's in um, a forbidden row or a column, which is slightly different. Um, if, so like let's change, let's change the top left back to X and let's change um, the bottom left to an X. Uh, so the thing is this configuration might be uh, solvable, right? Because we could pop up this X indirectly if we hit something in the row. Like the column is forbidden, but we could fix it if we could hit something in the row, right? Or the X should be in the final configuration. Oh, so put it, okay. Or no, uh, the final configuration, like, so the bottom left start should be X. The bottom left final should be O. And then the bottom right final should be X, let's say. Yeah. So in this case, we can fix this X because we can pop it up by hitting something in the same row, right? Um, okay, so I claim um, in almost all the cases, the answer is possible. Um, so all the remaining X's we know lie in their own column or row, right? Because like we already marked which ones are forbidden and which ones like the ones that are not forbidden have to lie in their own row or column just by definition. Um, so we can always hit just those X's and like it, they don't interact with each other. They'll like, they'll always pop up everything in their same row or column. Um, so the tricky thing is like, you have to check the state where everything starts like as up. So if the bottom right, in this case, on the final configuration was a no, um, this is actually not possible because like, in this case, we can't pop up the X here um, because like we have to hit something down, but like we can't hit anything down because there's no X's in the final. Um, so actually like one tricky case is like, let's say we added another row to this. Uh, to both boards, and let's just say they're both all O's. Yeah, like another row with all O's. Okay, um, so let's change the bottom right of the final to an X, actually. Um, so what I claim is this case is possible. Um, so even though I can't, like, I can indirectly fix this by hitting something in the third row first, and then I can pop something up by hitting something in the fourth row. I see, and then you would hit this this one, and then make that you know, yeah. So as long as like there's one x in the final configuration, that means I can fix everything if there's any differences. So if the boards are exactly the same, like it's possible. Otherwise, I need to make sure that I have something that's down and something that's up in the starting and final configuration, like something that's down in the Final conversion is something that's up in the starting. Um, yeah, but like those are, I think, all the cases. So um, this is just like handling some cases. The first step is like noticing that you mark some set of forbidden rows and columns, and then it makes the problem much easier to analyze. OK, um, so in this problem, you're given a 2D grid again. Um, and uh, it's like R by C, and then the grid contents contain some permutation of like distinct numbers between one and R times C. Okay, so here's like an example grid, three by three. Yeah, um, so first we define a monotonic subgrid as something that, uh, where every single row and column decreases or increases, and it can be different for different rows and columns. Um, so this grid, I think, is monotonic. Like you can see, each row is increasing or decreasing, 
in each column is increasing or decreasing, and it's not the same for different rows and columns. So this is strictly increasing, and since they're all unique, you don't need like yeah. There's no equal like things to worry about for equality. Um, okay, so um, what we want to do is we want to count the number of subgrids that are monotonic. So subgrid in this case is defined as a subset of rows and a subset of columns. It doesn't have to be contiguous, and then we just take like the elements in that row and column. So we could select these two columns, these two rows. Yeah, and then three would also be included, yeah. And then this is like one subgrade of like one, five, nine, three, right? And the problem is count the number of monotonic subgrades. And the bounds are pretty small. They're only up to 20 for each dimension. So it suggests we have to do an exponential solution. So uh, yeah, so the first step is like, let's fix some subset of rows and then Let's try to count the number of columns that's compatible with that su subset of rows. So once we fix some subset of rows, we know which columns we can use or not, because each column is either, like, we need to make sure that column is increasing or decreasing. So maybe let's add, like, another row here. Yeah. Something like this. So mm -hmm. maybe these are the three we can, we can check, okay, we could use this column. Yeah, so that's column's value base is increasing. The second column's value base is increasing. The third column is not valid because it's not increasing. Yeah, so it goes decreasing. down and then back up. OK. So once we fix some subset of rows, we know which columns are valid. So we have some subset of columns that are valid to use. And then now how do we count? So like um, one case is like a single one, like one column by itself is a valid configuration. So like we add the number of valid columns to our solution immediately. Um, then now we consider grids that have size at least two. Um, so uh, basically, let's look at each pair of columns, right? So each pair of columns uh, has some inequalities between those pairs of elements. Actually, let's choose the first and second columns because the third column is not valid, so we're not going to consider that. Um, so each uh, pair of columns, for each of the rows, it has some inequality, right? Either it's greater than or less than. So you can write it as some like bit string saying like um, the first thing in the subset is increasing, the second thing is decreasing, the third one's increasing, so on, right? Um, so for this pair of columns, it has like the bit string like one, zero, one, right? Where one represents increasing and zero represents decreasing. Um, okay, so now what um, if we want to pair up more than two columns, we need to make sure every single pair or every single adjacent pair has the same like signature, right? Like has the same bit string signature. Um, that way, like we make sure that it's the same direction as we go across. Ah, so the so these bits are basically just telling you what direction this is going. So we're pairing up these two columns. So this is one because it's this way. This is zero because it's this way, and this is one because it's this way. Okay. So one way you can think about this is like let's say we fix the directions of like which way we wanted each row and column to go, right? Like this is a little bit too slow right now, but let's just say we did that. That we can compute the number of like valid configurations with using some DP, right? We just make sure each, like the next column that we add is compatible with the previous column we added for this particular string, right? And then um, we can do like an n squared DP from that. Um, so it's like counting the number of valid columns about sets of columns ending at a particular location matching a certain bit string. Um, so this is a little bit too slow right now if you try to iterate through all the bit strings because it will take like um, 2 to the n times like the number of bit strings. So it's like 3 to the n, I think, um, times m squared. Or it should just be 3 to the n times m squared. Oh, uh, right, because it's subset yeah. of subsets. OK, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a little bit too slow right now, but let's see how to speed it up. Uh, so the thing is, like, we can keep this map, or like this DP, we can compute this DP simultaneously for all bit strings. Um, like, we don't need to, like, iterate through bit strings and then compute this, like, for each bit string, because, like, in the vast majority of cases, like, we're not going to touch all subsets, right? Like, there's only, at most, m squared valid patterns that appear. Um, m squared coming from, like, pairs of columns, right? 
Yeah, that that makes sense to me. Um, yeah. So, uh, we can like only look at the interesting patterns. Um, in some sense, right? Like we can um do our DP normally, but um, like we can have like some sort of map which maps like bit string to count, right? And we can show that this map won't be very large. So we can do like the DP in one pass simultaneously for all patterns. Um, and then I think that gives you a runtime of like of two to the n times m squared. And this is fast enough now. All right, so the next problem we're going to cover is problem F, which is heaps of fun. Um, yeah, so in this problem, you're given a tree with n nodes, um, and it's rooted at node at some node. And um, in each node, there's a value b. And um, what you do is you choose a number between 0 and b randomly. And it can be any real number. It's not necessarily an integer. And um, you want to know what's the probability that this um, tree forms a heap. Um, and in this case, we define the heap to be a min heap. So each node has values strictly smaller than um, its subtrees. OK, so it has to be strictly smaller. So this would be a heap with these values because this is strictly less than this. And then if we swap these two, for example, then uh, this doesn't agree, so it's no longer a heap. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so there are two different ways to approach this as far as I know. So I think the first approach, which almost everybody did, I think during the contest was um, you look at uh, the probability distribution of like, um, so it's some sort of DP. So it's a little bit tricky because um, the values are real values, not necessarily integers. If you're familiar with like, uh, I, I don't remember what they're called exactly, like CDFs. Um, I don't remember what it stands for, or like PDFs, I think. It's like a probability distribution function, I think. And it's like the cumulative distribution function. Uh, I don't know if those are the right things exactly, but um, basically it just says like, what's the probability that um, this node has value less than or equal to x um, and everything below is a subtree. Um, yeah, so if you compute this, if you're able to compute this probability distribution, then um, the answer is just like the probability that like one is less than or equal to like infinity or something for some very large value at the very end. Um, so the key observation for this approach is that the probability distribution is a polynomial. Um, and you can use that to like multiply two polynomials when you're at some subtree to combine and then you need to integrate something. Um, so like you can get something that works with that approach. So um, yeah, this is just a very rough out outline. Um, I'll try to explain the another approach I had, which I think is doesn't involve any calculus at all, but it's I don't think anybody used this approach. Um, so I guess one way you can think about it is like um, if let's just say all the number all the nodes in the tree had the same value b, um, so like every node is chosen randomly between zero and b, um, what's the probability that this tree forms a heap? Um, so the way you can solve this is like you can look at the tree. So you can say what's the probability the root is the smallest value out of all the nodes that I choose. And since I chose all the random, uh, all the values randomly, um, it's just equal to like one over n, right? Like one over the number of nodes in the tree. Um, because like every distribution of like uh, values is equally likely, and the minimum is like probably one over n of lying at the root. Um, but the thing is, this logic also holds for every single subtree. So like for the topmost node, it has probably one fifth. For this subtree circle, it has probably one third of being the smallest at the top. And for the leaves, that's probably one of being the smallest. You can show that these are independent in some sense. So if you just multiply all these probabilities, then you get the probability that this tree is a heap if all these values are the same. Um, so uh, how do you generalize this back to the problem where nodes can have different Bs, right? Like you don't know which range it lies in. 
Um, so one observation you is you can just split the range or like split the set of real numbers that you can map to to like n different ranges given by like the n different these that can appear. Um, and then what you can do is you can kind of like fix what's the number of nodes that lie in this subtree in this range um, and uh, do DP based on that kind of. Uh, so basically, uh, if you're at like node, the root node, you can just say like, what's the probability it lies within zero to B1, B1 to two, B2, B2 to B3, and so on. And that's like uh, not that hard to compute. It's just like B2 minus B1 minus the length or divided by the length of the range. Um, so you can get the probability that a certain node lies within a certain range. And um, so what do you mean by length of range? Or like length of um, like the original B value of that node. So like if the root had like B R or something, then it's just divided by B R. And so what do you mean by B1 and B2 then? Uh, so like, I guess the Bs are just like sorted. Uh, like maybe it's easier to name them something else like A1, A2. It's just like the sorted arrays of Bs. Oh, okay. And so these are the indices then, or? Uh, yeah, so like we're, we're mapping it to a specific range and just saying like it lies in, in, in between these two values. And um, the reason why this helps is um, I want to like fix the number of nodes I put in this like tree in this range because like I know how to solve this problem when all the numbers are in, in the same range, right? It's just like you take one over the subtree size, like over all the nodes, uh, or and take the product over all, the, all of those. Um, so now you can get some DP solutions. So your DP solutions are just like, what's the number of ways to um, distribute, uh, or like what's the probability of success given that the root node or like the current node that I'm considering lies within this range, and like the subtree size is equal to some number, right? So like your DP has three parameters, like uh, the node you're at, which range it lies in, and like the size of the subtree. And uh, yeah, then there are a few cases, like one is uh, you like you can split up uh, how many things go into each child's child node, like how many uh, subtree nodes you want to allocate to each child. Um, and then you also, like, if you ever reach subtree size zero, you need to, like, go on to, do, like, the next range because you want to make sure you're bigger. So right now, like, this DP, um, it has three numbers, each of which can all go up to N. Uh, so, and each of them take, like, N time to update if you consider each child. So right now, like, this looks like N to the fourth, but you can reduce it to N cubed by, um, like there's some trick where like you only iterate through like the subtree size rather than like all the way through n for the last parameter, and like that will speed up to n cube. Oh yeah, that's the trick from like the looking for a challenge book, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's called exactly, but like, um, yeah, you you do need that if you want to use this approach. Um, I do want to mention like the polynomial approach. It's possible to do an n squared. Um, you can actually get a factor event out, like um, if you notice that like all the like left endpoints of the intervals are all the same because like all the numbers are between zero and B. Um, so that does simplify the problem a lot and lets you solve it in N squared, but we wanted to allow like different approaches to work. So that's why it's like this. Uh, we didn't know actually like N squared was possible before because we all kind of approached it more generally. Yeah, so uh, like MIT solution was N squared, right? Or uh, I think almost most people's solutions might have been n squared, like if they added this optimization. Like, but it's like sometimes hard to tell if you added it or not. So like the difference is very small. All right. So the next problem we're going to talk about is this problem I, which is cutting strings. Okay. Uh, so in this problem, you're given a string of lowercase letters and a number k, and you can uh, remove k substrings from the string. And uh, you want to end up with the lexicographically largest string um, that can come from this process. Um, so like, let's say k is equal to like 2, for example. Um, I can cut out the first three characters and then the two characters between the Ds. 
and um, I get this string like DDA, and like I can show that's the lar lexicographically largest string I can get. Yeah, and in this case, lexicographically larger if like a string x is a prefix of the string y, then like y is lexicographically larger than x. So like you do want it to be as long as possible um, if you like yeah like a like four a's is bigger than three a's. Usually for like problems with lexicographically larger, you just try to do it greedily. Um, so you can do a greedy solution for this problem, uh, but there are uh, a lot of edge cases, I guess. So you do have to be careful. Um, so let, let's just say, um, let's look at the highest value character you have, right? Like the lexicographically largest character in your string. Um, so currently right now it's D. Um, so ideally what we want is to put all the Ds in the front, right? Like we want to cut everything that comes before D and like remove it from the string. Um, so uh, let's try to do that greedily first, right? So like we can check how many string substrings do we need to cut if we want to get all the Ds at the beginning. And that's easy to compute. It's just like you look at the number of like uh, cuts you need to make between the Ds or something like that. And um, you can get the number of substrings you need to cut out. Um, so if K is bigger than that, then obviously you want to do that. And then you can recurse on the suffix of the string and then um, look for like the next largest character and keep repeating that. So the interesting case is when K is less than the number of cuts you need. So like you need to determine like what are the optimal cuts I need to make. Um, so your first goal is to maximize the number of Ds at the beginning of the string. Um, so uh, the first thing you can do is like any, any Ds that appear at the beginning of the string, you can kind of get for free. Like they just come no matter what you do, like uh, you don't need to explicitly make any cuts to like get those. So um, let's just assume that the string starts with a non-D character, um, just initially, just to make it a bit easier to analyze. Um, so now all the other Ds form some consecutive region of Ds, right? Like they have some like islands of Ds uh, and they're of different sizes, right? So like if we have two together, they're on the same island. So we kind of like group them together. Yeah. So you can compute these sizes, the sizes of these groups. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the other characters are. They're just like less than D and you want to um, ignore them. And what I want to do is if I can cut K, sub, uh, K strings out of the string, I can get K of these islands. Um, that's what I'm claiming. And like that's not hard, too hard to see that like you can definitely achieve that, um, and like you can't do any better than that. So um, obviously, we want to take the k largest islands from the string. Um, the problem is now like there is some suffix of these that like we want the last one to still be like lexicographically largest, right? So like in that case, we need to use like let's imagine like k is equal to one in that case. If k is only equal to 1, like I want to take the longest like islands of these, but then I want the lexicographically largest um, suffix from there, right? Uh, so I still need some sort of like suffix array to compute to be able to compare like which island is the best like last, last island I can use. Um, so uh, basically the first step is like you can compute um, what's the maximum number of Ds I can put at the beginning of the string? That's easy. And then you also need to compute, like, what's the lexicographically largest uh, suffix I can add at the end? And you need to make sure that, like, that suffix is attached to, like, one of the islands that you actually did need to use. Um, so in this case, uh, we can only get two of the islands, right? We can get an island that has uh, length three and an island a length two, right? Um, so in this case, like we can get five Ds at the beginning, and now it's just a matter of determining what's the lexicographically largest substring we can get at the end. Um, so we don't need to take the first island of two Ds. We can actually take the last island of two Ds, which is better, because then we get five Ds, then C, B, which is better than like something that ends, that starts with A, right? Um, so the problem is like if the last island was actually only one D, it's optimal to take the first three islands, right? Because like I want to maximize the number of these to get. Um, so like you need to make sure like 
your suffix is attached to an island that is part of some optimal solution. Ah, uh, I see. So when it when it's shorter, then you basically have to you have to compare the the ending d's, the last d's that you take, and then uh, attach the rest of the string to that, and you just like compare the like you're you're basically comparing this group with its extra piece, this group with its extra piece, and this group with its extra piece, and this is what you need the suffix array for because you need to compare these three. Um, so you don't actually uh, include the d's in this suffix array, like you only include the part immediately after the d, um, like you compare those suffixes, because that's a little bit better. And the thing is, like you can't use the first one, like let's say it's like ddx, right? Like you can't, um, or uh, x is not a good one because x is bigger than d, but like, um, like if the first, like you can't use the first group because like that's not, that can't be the last island in an optimal solution. These are not even like enough islands you can take. So like, yeah. So you need to start from the point where you have enough d's ahead of you. Yeah, and then um, then you can take those suffixes and see which one's the best one. And you also need to be maximizing the d's, so that's a little bit tricky too, I guess. Yeah. Um, so the way you can do that is if you just sort the islands by length and then break ties by position. Um, like you just see what's the first possible position at which um, I have enough fees and then everything after is going to be okay. Like I can take that as long as it's attached to an island that has the same length as like the last island that I could have used. Um, another way you can do it is like you can sweep um, left to right or uh, yeah, left to right and you keep a priority queue of like length k. Um, and then as long as like that is bigger, then like you can compare the suffixes from there. All right, so the uh, next problem we're going to talk about is uh, planes, trains, but not automobiles. Um, so the idea with this problem is you're just given a graph and this graph tells you um, what flights, or uh, not flights, but what trains you can take. So these are train lines and uh, they run from city to city. Uh, and you can stay on the same train for, for a long period of time. So it's always possible to go from like city one to city four. Um, but once you hit the end of a train line, uh, so the train lines are all DAGs, uh, like the graph formed by this is a directed acyclic graph. Um, so you can end up taking flights to um, basically make it so you can visit all cities. So the idea is you want to visit every single city uh, and you want to take the minimum number of flights. So maybe this is a train line that I end up taking from city one to city four. And then I take a flight to city three uh, from city four. And that ends up giving me um, the answer. Uh, and so I only uh, need to take one flight. Um, but the, the problem also, and so I can start in any city, that, that's another piece. Um, so that's the first half of the problem is, can you just tell me what the minimum number of flights are? And the second one is you want to know in an optimal solution, which airports you can visit. And it's across all possible flights. So uh, for this one, there are a few different train lines you could take. So I'll just write them out here. And so you can see that the, the small arrow is a train line, but these bigger ones are a flight. Um, so you can see these are the airports I would end up visiting uh, because I'm either visiting it to leave that city or visiting it to come into that city. Um, and these are since these are the only possible um, answers, you basically take the union of all these. <clears throat> and that tells you what airports it's possible to visit in some optimal trip. Um, so you want to spit that answer out. Um, and you can rearrange the flights in any order. You can uh, fig figure something out like this. A pretty uh, classic problem for the first half called DAG cover. Um, so the idea is in this kind of problem, you're just given a directed acyclic graph. And what you want to do is you want to know the minimum number of traversals so that you can um, visit everything in the graph. Uh, and so 
what you realize is um, it's basically like a path cover of the DAG. Um, and so what you realize with paths is every single node either has something coming into it or something coming out. Um, and if it's at the head of the path, there's nothing coming into it. And if it's at the end of a path, then there would be nothing coming out of it. So what I can do is I can kind of take each vertex and split it in half. And so, um, and make a bipartite graph from this idea. So the nodes on the left, what I'm going to draw are just nodes from the graph that um, this represents what's leaving this vertex. And then this is splitting the node on the right. And this is uh, going into some vertex. And so what I can do is I can just take all the edges in the graph and just point where they leave to where they enter. And you end up getting a graph like this. And if you end up finding a uh, maximum matching, so maybe I take this edge and this edge and this edge, um, if I take all the edges that were involved in the uh, maximum matching, then that's going to correspond to a path in my DAG cover. Um, and so uh, you'll see, I guess you wouldn't, wouldn't ever point to yourself, so maybe this is a bad example. Um, so maybe something like this. Um, but so this would be like one goes to two. So this is vertex one, this is vertex two. Uh, actually, that, that's not a matching either. One, one goes to two, two goes nowhere. And then three goes to one. So I'll point three to one. And then four goes to three. So I'll point four to three. And you'll see that um, the number of paths is just going to be n minus this maximum matching. Because every time you add one of these matchings, you're reducing the number of things that has n degree 1. And so this would correspond, if you want to pull out the actual paths, you just look at the maximum matching, you pull out the paths, and then that corresponds to a DAG cover. So uh, when do you take flights? So what you're going to get is you're going to have a bunch of paths. And if you don't have something uh, coming into you, or if you don't have something uh, leaving you, then you're a flight. And so what, what you want to do is you want to know, is it possible to um, basically unmatch some vertices in this DAG? Um, and so for every single vertex, you need to know, can I unmatch this vertex and match it with something else uh, in terms of uh, uh, maximum matching or our bipartite matching will have already found something that would have unmatched um, is the idea. And so you can do this naively because you can just find augmenting paths. Like you could um, maybe start at some vertex and I, it's like, okay, I need to find something else to um, to match to if I uh, I want this one to leave. I need, to, like for example, uh, if I want this node to no longer be involved in the matching, then this node needs to match to something else coming into it. And so um, maybe, maybe there's something like this. And so I can exchange this edge for this, but there could be some really long sequence of augmenting paths that gets you uh, an unmatching. Um, but uh, if you want to do this naively, like do just augmenting paths, that's a problem because the n in this problem is up to 10 to the fifth. Um, so what we can do instead is realize that the paths for the unmatching um, can form a kind of general graph. So if I'm on the left side and I'm currently uh, matched to something, then it there will be a forward edge. So I'll just redraw this graph over here. So it ends up matching uh, to this node. It's going as a forward edge. But if I'm going from left to right, if I'm taking an unmatched edge, it can go in the opposite direction. And so anything that's a matched edge will go from left to right. Anything that's an unmatched edge will go from right to left. So you end up getting a graph like this. And if you want to find if a path um, 
can end up hitting an unmatched position. What we can do is we can march, mark all these unmatched unma positions that are on the left. And, um, and so if I wanna find like what can be unmatched from the left-hand side of this, this graph, I can take the reverse of this graph, mark all the unmatched positions, compute the strongly connected components, and then just do a DP. And so the DP will basically be percolating uh, this unmatching to all the nodes that can figure out how to get to it through a series of augmenting paths. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Lewin, does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, basically you, you just want to find like uh, whether an unmatched node can reach a match node through some augmenting path. Yep, yep. Uh, but uh, apparently there's even like a simpler solution. Uh, so I don't know what the judges did that found like an even simpler solution, but I was just thinking of it in terms of these augmenting paths. And the other thing to, to realize is like, it may look like it's a bit tricky at the beginning or the end. Ah, let's move back. Um, the beginning or the end of the sequence, uh, you don't actually take a flight. But the thing to realize is any of these flight pattern or any of these train patterns can be rotated. So I could easily take this one, three, four and swap it with a two. And now I'd have a flight. So like bring this guy over here. This is the two. And now I have a flight from two to one and that's just a different sequence. So that detail ends up not mattering. Okay, so the next problem we're going to talk about is this problem called Knight of the Tart cards, Tarot cards. Uh, and the idea for this problem is you have some like knight on a chessboard and it's an infinite chessboard. And if you remember knights move in this kind of a pattern, um, except in this case, we're looking at a generalized knight. Uh, and so instead of going up to and then over one, like a knight would do, uh, it can be any a B combo, um, for knight moves. Um, <clears throat> and the first like sub problem you have to figure out here um, is if I'm at some position at uh, P1, is it possible to reach position P2? So this is kind of just a sub problem of the problem we're trying to solve. And the harder version of this problem we're trying to solve is some locations on this chessboard have cards that can make you jump new distances. Uh, so instead of AB, there's like a different AB value. Um, and so at that cell, what you can do is you can jump to that cell, possibly purchase some tarot card, and then it'll improve the ability of like jumps that you can make um, from that point on. Uh, so you have some starting location. You're trying to reach cell zero, zero. And uh, you can do that by purchasing any number of uh, tarot cards um, from where you started to where you end up. Uh, okay, so the first subproblem is like just figuring out if I'm at some position P1, can I reach some position P2? So let's think about a simpler problem is instead of thinking about it in 2D, let's just think about it in uh, one dimension. And we're going to, let's say we have like two types of jumps, uh, size A and size B. So let's just pick something very, fairly simple, three and then five. Um, so let's say I can make a size three jump in either direction, or I could make a size five jump in either direction. And I can make any number of jumps, um, in either direction and it'll end up solving the problem. Uh, and so like, if I want to figure out how to get from position zero to any position on the, um, on this number line. Uh, there's a fairly easy way to calculate that if you have two types of jumps. Uh, it's called Bazoo's theorem. Um, but it, what this theorem basically says is the GCD of A and B is equal to SA plus uh, TB for some S and T. So in other words, there's always going to be a way to find an S and T to end up reaching a position uh, that's the GCD of both of them. And if you wanted to reach anything that's a multiple of the GCD, what you can do is you can multiply this entire equation by that X value 
and you can end up hitting any multiple of that GCD. So in this case, the GCD is three and five. So what we can do is we can end up reaching every single cell in that case, but if uh, in, in either direction. And if you actually wanted to find this S and T, you could use the extended Euclidean algorithm to find it. And so uh, another example would be something like, let's say the jumps were two and six, then we could end up reaching any even position on the number line. Okay, so how does that help us uh, solve the 2D version of this problem? Um, well, we've we basically figured out like in the 1D version, like what cells we can hit if we had like two different numbers. Um, but let's try to make our knight uh, independent of each dimension. That, that's like a good starting place. So let's say the jumps are two and then, well, we'll, we'll just do standard knight moves. Um, so if it's two and one, what we could do is we could go one right and then two down, and then we could go up two and then over one. And you'll notice that it basically is uh, those two moves together give us a way to jump two to the right. Uh, similarly, we could do something where it's like over two and then up one and then back and then over two. And that uh, allows us to jump four to the right. So we could end up hitting this location and this location through a series of jumps. Um, and what, what you'll realize is um, it's just, if you take the, the two numbers here, if you just multiply that by two, then you'll end up getting the one dimensional jump case. And in fact, if you um, just take the GCD of the, the two numbers that you can jump by, uh, you can end up uh, hitting anything that is two times the GCD of those numbers on the number line for the same reason by Bazou's theorem. Uh, so in this case, we can hit all the odd cells. <clears throat> And this also holds in the Y dimension because it's just the same thing mirrored. So then the only thing that's a little bit tricky is when you end up making a two jump over and then maybe a, um, a one jump up like this, let's say, then you end up having that exact same uh, location piece, but mirrored again. So you, you can see like in all dimensions, like this, this is just like an offset position um, based on one, one night's jump, but I end up getting the exact same um, set of things. So maybe I draw it in a different color, but the, the whites were like original set of two jumps and then the odd jumps are going to just be a different color, something like this. So you can see they're all uh, size two jumps away from each other. And this is, um, and then you can mirror the same thing in the other direction. So you'll, you'd actually have something like this. Um, <clears throat> so what you'll notice here is this kind of forms like a grid case where every single cell is possible for two, one. Uh, but you could have a little bit more complex cases. I don't know, something like uh, three, one, for example. Um, we get a little bit different behavior. So maybe this is our, our night. We go up one over three, uh, so three. So it goes to this cell and then it can hit this cell, it can hit this cell, so anywhere on, on the two. Um, but when I jump over one, like I make a one move instead of a two combo move that keeps it in the same dimension, you'll notice that it's actually offset from the white. So in this case, it's not the, the grid case, but it's actually like a checkerboard pattern. So if you look in the solutions, uh, you'll see some people saying like, oh, there's a sequence of moves that is uh, on a lattice or a grid. And there's also a sequence of moves that's on a checkerboard pattern, but that's all dependent on this night move. Um, is it offset from the row over here? So let's, um, let's make a bigger jump. Um, and so I, what I'll do is I'll do four one. Um, so for four one, I can, I can reach one over. Um, but I, one, two, three, four, I also end up hitting this location right here. And so you'll notice that this actually syncs up with uh, the pattern of size two jumps. 
so for, for 401. Um, and so what this will do is it'll actually form uh, the, the grid pattern um, that we're talking about. Same thing with uh, four uh, or like eight two or something. Like eight two will also um, will also form that pattern. Uh, but one one thing that can happen uh, when you do the lattice or do the grid case is you can actually have a gap in your lattice or grid, and it's based on the GCD of the two jumping numbers. Um, so you can have something more complicated like this. Uh, so you can, you can define it as either it'll be uh, a lattice like this, so we'll call that the G0 case, or you can end up having a checkerboard case. And this is just for one pattern of knight's moves that's defined by GG. So I'll just call this like a zero flag if it's the G0 case, or a one flag if it's the G1 case. Uh, and it turns out if you buy new move patterns, um, you can take the GCD again of that new move pattern and the current move pattern, because the new move pattern is going to be one or two of any of these cases. And what you'll get is a smaller GCD value, so a smaller G value, and you'll get one of these numbers. And so what you realize is if you're at some position and you have some number of tarot cards, it doesn't matter what your tarot cards are. Like the cells that you can reach can be uniquely defined by the GCD value of the cards, like the night moves that you bought off the card. And depending on what type it was, was it a type one or was it a type zero? Uh, so was it a checkerboard or was it lattice? Um, and so there aren't that many of these. Uh, I forget what the exact calculation was. Um, so if you're doing this, you can save this as a DP state or a state of a graph, like think Dijkstra's algorithm. And you can just run Dijkstra's or you can run a DP. And so the, the, once you figure out one of these two patterns, like the code's actually like a pretty standard problem uh, in terms of like dynamic programming or uh, Dijkstra's. And the reason the dynamic programming works, like you, you may wonder, oh, how is there a DAG? Well, this GCD value just always goes down. So as long as you only transition if your um, state of reachable cells became narrower, then that's good. Uh, and then from a given state, the only thing you want to know is, is the goal state 0, 0 reachable from where you currently are with the set of moves you have? All right, so the next problem that we're going to talk about in the set is problem C, cost of living. Um, yeah, so in this problem, you're given uh, some like items that uh, you can buy, and you know like the price that it costs in each year, or like let's say you need the price in each year. Um, and there's only at most like 10 years and like 100 different items you can get. Um, for each different year, you know there's some inflation rate um for uh like between like your i and your i plus one um and for each item you have some modifier for that specific item and um you know that uh given like the price that satisfies a certain equation so the equation is that the price of item i at your j plus one is equal to the price of that item in the previous year um, times the inflation of the year, times the modifier of the item, uh, ij here, and then, yeah, so now, um, or modifier j, so modifier in a certain item, or it should be inflation j and modifier i, uh, that's what you wrote, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, sure, okay, it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, okay, yeah, but, um, yeah, so basically some of these are actually unknown. Uh, so you're not given all the prices or inflations or modifiers. You're given like some partial information, which you're guaranteed to be consistent. And um, then you're given some queries like what's the price of item I at your J? Um, and you want to answer the queries. So you answer like some like number if it's like if you can uniquely determine it. Otherwise, you print like negative one if it's not uniquely determinable. Um, so in this case, uh, 
the number of variables you have is pretty high. It can be up to 1,000. Um, so like the number of items is up to 100, and the number of years is up to 10. So there can be up to like 1,000 different variables that you want to solve for. Um, but let, let's just say, let's just come up with a simpler solution first. So um, the first step that you need to take is to change this problem from multiplications to additions. So the way you can do that is take the log of every of both sides. Um, so if you take the log, then you get like the log price is equal to some sum of the other things. Um, and then basically this defines some linear equations. So once you have the linear equations, you can uh, use like Gaussian elimination to solve for those equations. Um, and yeah, that like pretty much works directly if you just use it. Um, like right now the bounds are a little bit big because it's like a thousand cube. So there is a way to reduce the number of variables. Um, like uh, you only really need to know the price at the first year or like um, you only need one variable to determine the price of the first year because every other price is uniquely determined from that. So um, basically like you're, you can represent the price at a certain, of a certain item at a certain year as like a, linear combination of the price of each item at year zero, right? Uh, and also the inflations and modifiers. So you actually only need like C times, uh, C plus Y variables, or like two times Y variables or something like that. Um, or like two times C plus Y, uh, because you need one for the price at year zero, one for the modifier, and then one for the inflation. And that's that uniquely determines everything else. Uh, and then if you run Gaussian elimination on this, this now should be fast enough. All right, so the last problem we're going to talk about is this rocket-powered hovercraft problem. Okay, so in this problem, you're given um, a hovercraft or a, like some sort of vehicle, and it's originally at position zero, zero in the grid, and it's facing in the positive x direction. So in this case, the direction of the rocket matters um, and your, you, your task is to get to position x comma y um, for some x, y in the plane. It can be like anywhere, but it's like the coordinates are pretty small. It's only at most a thousand absolute value. And um, in this problem, you're given also the maximum speed you can travel and also the maximum speed you can rotate your car in. Um, so uh, in this problem, there's no acceleration. You just basically instantly go to your max speed and you instantly go to your max rotation. Um, you also have the restriction that, uh, so basically the task is to find the shortest time needed to get to position x, y, given your speed. So like you have a number v for your velo maximum velocity and then a number w for your maximum uh, speed of rotation. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically, uh, you also have one additional constraint, um, which we added just to, uh, which I believe is true for like an optimal path. Um, but you can only start and stop your velocity once, and you can only start and stop rotating exactly once. And you have to go at full speed on when you like start and stop for those. Um, yeah, and then your task is just to come, uh, go to the end in the shortest time possible. Um, so maybe we can do like an example. So like, let's just say um, here like x, y is like x is zero and y is like 10 or something. And so like it's directly above you and you're facing originally to the right. And um, so like, let's just say like, I forget what the sample looks like exactly, but like if I move and rotate at the same time, I kind of follow something that looks like a semicircle. So, um, and if it happens that like those are the right speeds, um, then it works out. I forget what the exact numbers are, but I think one of the samples is matches this. Um, so like if I turned on both my forward velocity and also rotation velocity, both at the same time for the full duration, I'll reach my goal by just following the semicircle. Um, and uh, in this task, like basically you have to decide when you want to like turn on your like velocity and when you want to turn on your rotation 
if that makes sense. Like you can decide when to turn that on. Yeah, that makes sense. And you, you're always going at your max velocity, right? So. Yeah, so we made a few simplifying assumptions because I think um, we weren't sure if like all optimal solutions satisfied these conditions or like if there was some optimal solution that satisfied these conditions, but um, you, you always go at your max speed if you decide to turn it on and you can only turn on each uh, component independently at most once. And uh, so basically there are a few different cases for this. So like um, if you're facing directly towards your destination, obviously like you don't want to turn anymore. You just want to go max speed towards that uh, destination because uh, there's no other way you can get to that faster straight line. the fastest way. Um, the main trickiness comes for, from when you're, uh, when you want to rotate at the same time, right? Or like, you want to be able to rotate until you're facing directly at the destination and then go forward. Um, so as we saw before, if you both, if you move and rotate at the same time, your path follows some semicircle. And since you're going at max speed for both of them, it defines a circle or, or that defines what the circle kind of looks like. Um, so the thing you can control is that you can control kind of a little bit on how uh, how much you rotate before you move at all, right? So basically you can kind of rotate this circle around zero, zero a little bit before. Or, uh, or I guess like if you rotate before moving, um, then you can rotate the semicircle more uh, in a different direction. Um, but also like you can also stop rotating at a certain part of the circle and um, just go in a straight line. And that happens, like you can, kind of do that by taking the tangent from the final destination to the circle that you're traveling. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you can like start, you could start. So you always start in a semicircle arc. Um, you can kind of move the circle around a little bit and then you go straight like, and that's the tangent. And can you travel? So you're, you're always going to travel max speed or max acceleration. There's no like, yeah, you always have the max velocity, so you don't have to worry about like varying the size of the circle or like the circle size is always fixed based on the V and W values. Yeah, so basically there are a few ways to solve this one. I think one is there is a closed form solution. You just like analyze some cases based on where X, Y is. And like you can divide, you can like normalize so your like max velocity is one and your max rotations one also or something like that. Um, and that does... Uh, there's only like three different cases, I think, but I think the way most people approached it and the way that the judges initially wrote it was like, it is, you can use some sort of ternary search for it. So basically the main thing you can control is like how much you rotate your initial circle, like how much you rotate before you even move at all. And um, you can kind of um, look for, I guess like, you can like write a function that says like, okay, if I rotated this much before and then I started moving those speeds, I can compute the optimal path basically because like I know my circle path and then I can find out what the tangent is and then that's when I exit the circle path. Is there ever a case where you want to start moving and then start your circle? Um, so I think you can, um, there might be some cases like that. Um, I'm not too sure what they would look like though. Um, so I think what you can show is that um, you can always move the circle so that it touches one of the endpoints and you can make it so it touches the start point. Because like, if you want a straight line, then follow the circle, then want a straight line again, you can kind of um, move those parts all the way so that the circle path touches the beginning instead. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to prove it. It is a little bit messy though, but... Um, I think that's like the general idea. All right, so that's all the problems that we had in NAIPC uh, 2019. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the explanation and Lewin, thanks for coming back on and like explaining all the problems. Yeah, thanks for having me again on the show. So see you guys uh, future week.